So we're in the middle of our Practical Acts sermon series. We're going through the book of Acts and looking for some of these stories that we may not read too often, but that give us some very practical, concrete guidance on how to make decisions in a very messy world. And the question for this morning that we're looking at is, how can I lead someone to Christ? How can I lead someone to Christ? A few weeks ago, I was talking to Gavin about the scripture for this morning, and Gavin said that when he reads this passage, it reminds him of a Staples commercial from a few years ago. So this is a bit of an old commercial, so pardon the quality, but if you are of a certain age, you might remember it. Go ahead, Jana. So N equals what? Josh? Today we'll be performing a triple hop on the procedure. But you've never done that before. That's okay. Wouldn't it be nice if there was an easy button for life? Now there's one for your business. Staples, that was easy. So Staples did a whole series of commercials like this. Crazy situations where there's a button and you push that easy button and life gets magically easier. At first reading, this story from today sort of feels like you pressed the easy button. It's a story about a man named Philip. It's one of the people who was chosen to care for widows in the early church back in chapter 6. But here we're in chapter 8, and he has this unexpected meeting that turns out to be very, very easy. So we'll be reading Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 26. You can read along in your own Bible, or the words will be on the screen. Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 26. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south, to the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So Philip got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go over to this chariot. Join it. So Philip ran up to it, and he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you're reading? He replied, How can I, unless someone guides me? He invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb, silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and they saw him no more. And the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus. And as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Now, it really sounds like Philip pushed the easy button somewhere along the way on the road down toward Gaza. And I think people even 2,000 years ago may have had that feeling too. Was anybody else reading this in your Bible instead of on the screen? If you were, look at your Bible. Look at verse 36. And see, what comes after verse 36? It's actually verse 38. Yeah. So where does verse 37 go? It's in a little footnote down here at the bottom. What happened is we're pretty sure that Acts as it was went like it's printed in your Bible. There weren't verse numbers back then. And what verse 37 is, is some extra dialogue between Philip and the eunuch. Because people were reading the story, copying it over and over, and they thought, gosh... Surely it cannot have been this easy. 
It cannot have been this straightforward. Surely they talked about it more before he dunked him in the water. There must have been a little bit more. So they wrote a little bit more to make it make a little more sense because it does just seem so easy. You know, I talked to a lot of people about Jesus and I have never had a moment like this where a random person walked up to me on the street, handed me a Bible and said, could you explain to me what this means? And then when you're done, could you baptize me? And then after you've baptized me, maybe you could like put me on your three committees that are just the hardest to fill and the hardest to find volunteers for because I'm just that excited about all this. It, it, just, it doesn't seem like it happens that way, does it? Now, there was a time when it might not have been quite that straightforward, but there was a time when it was a little bit easier to bring people to faith. I talked to a retired pastor a few months ago. He was a pastor in the 1950s, and he told me that his church growth strategy in the 1950s was that when a family moved into his neighborhood, he'd go knock on their door, introduce himself, say where he was from, visit with them for a little while, and leave. And then about 60% of those families would come and join his church after that one visit. And that period in the 50s and 60s, that's when a lot of our churches hit their peak size because it was just a little bit easier back then to get people into the church. And of course, it's not like that now. We've got whole swaths of people who are you know, not religious at all, or maybe they're only vaguely religious. It does not seem quite so easy as it does in this scripture here. But when we look at this passage of Philip and the Ethiopian, we ask ourselves that key question, how can I lead someone to Christ? The truths are really the same. The steps are really the same now as it was then. There are several key things that I'd invite you to notice in this passage that Philip does that are still so important to us. The first is that we have to be open to encountering all people. We need to be open to encountering all people. The Ethiopian eunuch in this story, now he is reading the prophet Isaiah, so that may make him kind of accessible to Philip on one level, somebody who's already got some spiritual interest. But in a different way, this is probably not the first person that Philip would have picked to share faith with. This is a eunuch, and he's a foreigner, somebody from Ethiopia. So this is a person with two strikes against him, two social characteristics that make him a bit undesirable, probably not the first person that Philip would have walked up to. But in spite of all that, Philip has this conversation He's still open to the eunuch. When we limit who we are willing to encounter, we limit our ability to share the love of Christ with them. Remember at the birth of Jesus, after Jesus had just been born, the angels go to the shepherds, they make the first proclamation of the gospel in history, the first time the good news has ever been shared. Does anybody remember what they say? They say, don't be afraid. And they say, this is good news of great joy that's going to be for all people. It's not good news of great joy for the people that we think are ready to hear it. It's not good news of great joy for the people that seem really easy to talk to. This is good news of great joy that's going to be for all people. And if it's going to be for all people, then we have to make it available to all people. And we do that by being willing to encounter to talk with anyone that we meet, to be willing to share it with all people. The second thing that we see is that we engage with people where they are without any kind of agenda. We engage with people where they are without an agenda. This story begins when Philip gets a command from the Spirit in verse uh, 29. The Spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. Go over to this chariot and join it. It's a very open-ended statement. It's not go over to this chariot and figure out how to convert this man to Christianity. It's just go over there. Just be there. Just check out what's going on. At my house, we get visits all the time from Mormon missionaries, and they're always looking for the person who lived in the house before I did. 
So I don't know what that guy did, but he is on the Mormon's radar, and they are not going to let him go. But I don't mind, because I enjoy talking to the, to the Mormon missionaries. They always come in pairs, because they, all Mormons are encouraged when they're young to go on a mission, usually for two years, to spread the Mormon faith, to spread Mormon teachings. They attend a missionary training center. They've got about a dozen, I think, around the world. And young Mormons learn how to share Mormon faith with others. And I don't know exactly what they tell them in the training centers, but I do know that whenever I open the door to talk to a pair of Mormon missionaries, the conversation always goes basically the same way. And it's something like this. I'll open the door, you know, we'll introduce ourselves, and they'll start making some small talk. I'll say, so Andrew, what do you like to do? I'll say, well, I, you know, I like to hike, I like to be outside, I like to play board games, I like to travel. I'll say, oh, great, 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 you like to travel, you like to travel. Have you ever read anything while you're traveling? You ever read on the plane or anything to pass the time? And I'll say, well, yeah, I, I like to read, I guess. And they'll say, great, 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 have you ever read the Book of Mormon? And I'll say, well, yes, I have read the Book of Mormon. They'll say, oh, wonderful, you read the Book of Mormon. Did you ever have a chance to pray about what you read? And I'll say, mm, yes, I, I actually have, I guess, prayed about the Book of Mormon. And they'll say, great, 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 did you know that the Book of Mormon says, da, 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 da. Now, from the second I open the door, it's obvious they don't really want to talk to me, right? They don't really care about whatever I'm going to say. The whole thing is, a, is kind of a game to keep me talking so that I won't shut the door in their face so that they can tell me the lines about the Book of Mormon that they want to tell me. I never have the sense that they care about me as a person, and I always have the sense that I can only engage with them to the extent that I'll follow along with their agenda. If I'll play along, we can keep talking, but that's how it's going to work, which, which is really a shame because I'm pretty sure of all the people that they meet in a day, I'm probably the one who wants to talk about the Book of Mormon the most. But <laughs> they don't really want to do that. Now, people are not dumb. You know, they can tell. If, we, if you go up to someone, approach them, and your goal is to convince them that they're wrong, if your goal is to convert them to your way of thinking, they can tell. Wanting to share faith with people, wanting people to experience new life in God through Christ, that is a wonderful thing. That's a great goal. But our starting point always has to be the same starting point that Philip had when he approached the Ethiopian. Just go over to them. Just check out what's going on. Just see what's happening in their life. No script, no agenda set out in advance. The third thing that we see is that we have to be intentional about sharing our faith with others. We have to be intentional about our relationships with others. And this is a helpful counterpoint to that thing we just saw. Just because we don't have an agenda, just because we don't have a script all mapped out in advance, that doesn't mean that we have no purpose or that we're aimless. Philip in this story is very intentional and oftentimes we are not necessarily very intentional. Lifeway did some research in 2014. They found that millennials who are Baptist, so people between the ages of about 18 and their early 30s, those millennials who are Baptist, they feel more comfortable sharing their faith than any other age group in Baptist life. So that's awesome. You know, millennials get hated on all the time, but you guys are cool. Don't go anywhere. Stay with us. So of that group, 85% of them agree that they have some responsibility to share their faith. And 69% of those people, millennial Baptists, feel comfortable sharing their faith, more comfortable than any other age group. But even in that group that feels most comfortable sharing their faith, only 25% of them look for ways to share the gospel regularly and only 27% of them intentionally build relationships with people in order to share what Christ has done for them. That's very much the opposite of what Philip does here. When Philip runs over to the chariot, he doesn't say, so, seen any good chariot races lately? 
He doesn't say, well, it looks like a nice, nice weather for a chariot ride. Philip notices that this eunuch is reading the Hebrew scriptures. It's an obvious opening. So he strikes up that conversation. Hey, I see you're, you're reading something here. You're reading Isaiah. Seems like you're looking for something. You're seeking something. You know, tell me about that. You feel like you've found what you're looking for. Simple as that. Philip makes that intentional effort to start a spiritual conversation. If we are not intentional, then these relationships won't be built, and these conversations will never happen. We've got to be intentional. And finally, embracing the questions is just as important as giving an answer. Embracing the questions is just as important as giving an answer. I read someone the other day who who writes a lot about effective outreach. And the author gave a hypothetical scenario. And he said, too often, Christians rush past the question to get to an answer. Christians who embrace people's questions will be far more effective than those who don't. And then he says, listen to this difference. A non-believer might ask, so when I die, will I be reincarnated? And a Christian could answer, well... Christians don't believe in reincarnation, so no, not at all. You'll be resurrected in Christ. Or a Christian could answer, well, that's a great question. Thanks for asking. Actually, the Christian experience focuses on resurrection. Would you like to talk about that? And then he says, which answer would you rather hear? Now, of course, you'd rather hear that one that embraces the question. And that's what Philip does here. The eunuch is reading from Isaiah 53. The eunuch's question is about Isaiah 53. And Acts says, verse 35, Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, the one he was reading, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. Philip doesn't try and talk him out of his question, doesn't try and tell him he's dumb for reading Isaiah, and that it's all about Jesus now. He starts with where the eunuch is. He embraced the question and used that as the starting point for dialogue. Embracing people's questions is really so, so key for us. As Christians, a lot of us have really been conditioned not to listen to the questions of others when we're sharing about what our faith means to us. We have in our heads that the pattern has to be that we tell people about sin and about guilt and then we tell them about forgiveness. So our strategy usually works down to something like trying to convince people that they're terrible, trying to make them feel really bad about themselves so that they'll feel really guilty, so they'll be ready to hear this message about forgiveness that we've got packaged up for them. But the problem is that nine times out of 10, when we do that, we're trying to answer questions that people don't even have. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't meet a lot of people walking down the street who are just saying, oh my gosh, I feel so guilty. I feel like such a horrible person. I really need to be forgiven. Where can I find forgiveness? Now, if you meet people like that, by all means, go for it. But I don't meet a lot of people like that. I do meet a lot of people who have questions about what the meaning of life is about how to find purpose and meaning in life. I meet a lot of people who are wondering how they can make moral decisions, how they can know what's right and wrong. A lot of people with questions about life after death. I meet a lot of people, a lot, a lot of people, who are looking for community, who are wondering where they can go so that people will care about them. And guys, those are questions that the Christian experience has some answers to. I feel pretty good if those are the questions that we're going to talk about. We shouldn't be afraid of those questions. And it doesn't mean that we're never going to talk about sin or we're never going to talk about the cross. Those are important topics, and they're going to have to come up before anyone does come to faith. People will wrestle with them. But we have to be exactly like Philip. We have to start with the questions that people have, not the questions that we wish they had. We've got to grapple with people where they are, not where we wish that they were. And the result of these steps that Philip takes is that 
he shares the story of faith in a way that's meaningful with this Ethiopian eunuch. Like I said, I don't know if it will go quite so easily for you today as it seems in this story, but the process is the same. It's just a question of how you're going to live it out, how you can intentionally structure your life so that you're able to share with others what your faith means to you. It doesn't have to be an agenda. It doesn't have to be a script. It's not about that. You just need to be able to share what your faith means to you. Share your story with other people. Just have to be able to listen to the stories of others, to really care about what's going on in their life, to hear what questions they really have. But you have to be intentional about doing it. And I don't know what that would look like for you. Maybe it would mean going to some place that you could meet some, some people who are not Christian, making some friends outside of church. Maybe it would mean joining one of our life groups so that you've got a safe place to bring people when they have questions about faith. Our life groups are really perfect for that kind of slow but genuine relational evangelism where people can meet Christians in a a safe but non-threatening way. What I do know is that the scriptures really give us so many answers to that question of how can I lead someone to Christ? And I know that just as Philip was faithful to do what God said when approaching the chariot, we have to be faithful too in doing what God has asked us to do, which is just to tell other people what Jesus has done for us. As simple as that. So we'd like to give you just a minute to think about how you might do that in your own life. In just a moment, I'll ask you to think of a name of someone that you know that you think might need to hear about the love of Christ. And again, this is not someone that we're saying next Sunday they need to be here and they need to be on the property management committee. That's an agenda. This is just think of someone that you think could benefit from a word from you about what Jesus means to you. Think about that person. You'll have a moment to write their name down. And then once you've written their name down, you can decide for yourself what you'd like to, like to do with that. Maybe you want to keep that piece of paper with the name and just stick it in your Bible or somewhere to remind you to just be intentional about your interactions with that person this week. Or if you'd like to, you can take the name and just lay it at the foot of the cross here. You can do that too just as a reminder that Jesus is for all of us in this room, but he's also for all these names on these sheets of paper. So you'll have a minute to respond as you'd like to, and then at the end of the service, I will pray over all the names that we've written down and all the names at the cross here. So again, just think of that one person that you think might benefit from a word about Christ. If you're on the inside row here, or if there's no one on the inside row, there's some pens and paper. So if you'll take those and just pass them down so that everybody has one pen and one sheet of paper.